Bruchem Aboim B'Shem Irgin Shiritar Moses Boston. Like to welcome everyone to tonight's shir. All the men here in the main shul, all the women upstairs and downstairs, and everyone tuning in on the telephone or through the live broadcast. Bruchem Aboim. As you know, Irgin Shiritar's annual dinner is coming up Wednesday, August fifteenth. Perfect time to put in an ad in honor of the Magen Shir, whose shir you enjoyed, and help Irgin Shir Tar with our botzas of Tar throughout the year worldwide. Tonight's shir is sponsored by Rabbi Rom Spry. I'd also like to thank the Lohinger family for the support of tonight's Shiv. Tonight we have the cover to have with us once again Rav Moshe Meir Weishli, the Rav Agudis Yisrael of Staten Island. Fascinating question and answer for him. And the questions to be asked by the Inimitable country Yossi Toiv. I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. And it's my comfort to call on my wife for tonight's share. First of all, I'd like to uh, begin with just the uh, Mardasra of the Boston Ashul. And uh, with gratitude, we have over here Rabbi Bald. We all give him a uh, tremendous yasha kechacha for the massive worldwide habatzas taira that he does with the irgun shirai taira throughout the summer during the yemei shayvavim. <laughs> and uh, Hashem should give you the strength that you should be able to do it. Ad biyasagayo. I'd like to thank... Rabbi Deutsch, as always, um, and uh, also to uh, welcome my good friend Yossi Tov and to thank him for coming. Rav Weiss, we are aware of the devastating passing of Yehoshua Rebetzin. All of us would like to wish you comfort from Hashem and may he grant you health and all Torah blessings. Amen. Thank you. Since you've experienced tragic loss firsthand, we would like to start with several questions on this subject. To benefit the masses on how to deal with these challenges from a Torah perspective. So for starters, how does one cope and get through the overwhelming sadness of losing a loved one, especially when they leave us at such a young age? Okay, thank you. Um I'd like to also dedicate this year, Lili Nishmas, my Rebetzin. Many of the women that are here tonight will remember her coming to this year, uh, sometimes upstairs, sometimes downstairs. And uh, I'd also like to welcome our audiences on Yeshiva World, on TorahAnytime.com, Kalaloshin, the TCN Network, and of course, Irgun's live stream as well. Uh, it, is a, it, it has become a worldwide audience. Uh, Yossi has asked, how does one cope through, cope and get through devastating loss? And the answer is with great difficulty. Uh, but we have to know that Eina Kodesh Baruch Hu Babitruni Embriyosev, Hashem doesn't ask from anyone anything that they cannot handle. That's the lesson of Nasev and Ishma. I could say I will do even before I listen because I know, Hashem, you won't give me anything that I can't handle. So fortified with that, a person has to uh, get on with one's life. So I found a few things that I felt I would share Number one, they say over from Reb Chaim Kanievsky, who was completely devastated with his loss of Rebetzin Bacheva Esther Kanievsky, and when he would be overcome with grief, they would bring him a Taisus, and he would immerse himself in it and feel better. So someone would say, might say, that's a distraction. It's not that it's a distraction. 
What it is, is, is the Torah is the source of life. When a battery starts to die, so what you do is, is you plug it in. Your phone, you recharge it. The source of life is to be connected to Hashem, the Makar Achayim. And the way to connect with Hashem is through Torah. Because Kuchabarichu Varaisa Chadil. Hashem and the Torah is one. So when you plug into the Torah, then that's the fulfillment of what we say in this week's parasha, If you cleave to Hashem, So by, it's interesting, that's the simple meaning of the Pasuk, The Torah of Hashem is perfect, just like Hashem is perfect. Meshivas nafesh. It rejuvenates the soul. But also, to keep oneself busy. Grief is overwhelming thought. When one is busy, they don't think. So it's important. That's why it says in the Gemara, If a person is idle, it leads to depression. So one should keep busy. My mechutin, Rabbi Ingber, came to be Menachem Avelmi, and he told me that when he was a young boy of 14 years old, his, he was by a home of a widow who was very young and had little children screaming. Little children were screaming. She was crying. There were a bunch of people in the home coming from Menachem Avel. Nobody knew what to say. So, Rav Moshe walked in. Rav Moshe Feinstein. Zech Tzadik Levrach, Eschus Yogan Aleinu. And everybody was quiet, and they waited to hear what the Goyen would say. And he told her, Man Kind, one thing I will tell you. There will come a day where you'll be able to remember your husband without pain. So that's a, a Nechama, that there will be a time where you could remember happy, good things without it being painful. I had the opportunity this year to be scholar in residence by Rabbi Rabowski in Boca Raton, Florida. And in the course of giving shiurim, there was an old gentleman that came over to me to comfort me, and he said, listen, I, I buried a son. And one piece of advice I could give you is to be in pain, I can't tell you you're not going to be in pain. But don't manufacture pain, which is also a tremendous piece of advice for people that are grieving. Don't sit and start thinking and manufacture pain. Pain comes, you have to deal with it. But don't sit and manufacture pain. And Davin, to the one that we say, Hamokam Yenachem. Davin to the one that brings the Nechama, that he should bring Nechama. What should people say and do for a mourner of such a crushing loss? So the first thing is what not to do. What not to do it doesn't help to say platitudes. It'll pass. She had a good life. You have to get on with yourself. The, these things don't help. They sound nice, but they don't help. So you'll say, so then, I'm not going to go. Nothing to say. I'll tell them that's chaver chachet to gila mekaymoi. Baruch Hashem, I'm not in the person's shoes. I can't understand it, so I won't go. That's also not good. There's a ritva that says, "Why is a widower called an alman? An alman is called an almana because almana. She doesn't get a hundred in her ksuva. 
She doesn't get the hundred, the two hundred. She only gets a hundred. So almana, she doesn't get a hundred. But why is an alman? Alman is an awarded aksuva. Why is he called an alman? So the uh, <coughs> Ridva says it's from a lotion of Elaine, mute. Because when you come to the Alman, there's nothing to say. It's true for Alman. There's nothing, there isn't anything to say. Skull Yereba, Zalzan Gesund, he called me up and he said, Look, there's nothing I could tell you. So, what can you do? You can tell the person, I'm there for you. You could tell the person, I can't imagine how you're feeling. You could tell the person, Hashem should give you the koyach to get through this. And you could tell the person, if you need to talk, I'm available. One of the things that is crushing when someone loses a spouse is they, lo they lose the person that they talk to at the end of the day, in the beginning of the day. And Chazal says, O Chavrusa, O Misusa, either companionship or death. So it's a crushing, a crushing experience. And that's why friends can step in and say, please don't hesitate to call me. I'll make myself available to you. I've said this in the past, that etymologically the word reyecha, friend, shares the root of ra, of, of bad, evil, which is strange. You'll tell me reyecha is the same gezeira as roecha, a friend, Helps shepherd you through life. That I understand. But Ra? But you could tell who your friends are in hard times, in bad times. Be a friend in bad times. That you could do. Is there a way to understand the loss of someone so kind and so needed like your Ebertson? Or do we just say ours is not to reason why? So everybody will say, well, that's a time old question. Why do righteous people suffer bad things? But we shouldn't just shove it under the carpet. Because it's the reason why Ace of went with Tarbis Ra. It's very important to realize this. It says, on that day that Avram Avinu passed away, Esav did five terrible sins. He committed a murder, he committed adultery. Now most people think, oh, I know why, because it says that Avram Avinu passed away five years early, so he shouldn't see Esav go to Tarbis Ra. So that's when Esav was turned sour, so that's why Avram Avinu died that day, so he shouldn't see it. But they don't realize that the other way is also true. Esav went sour because this was the straw that broke the camel's back. The great Avram, the Amura Chesed, if he could die, <laughs> then what's it all about? What's it all about? It's very dangerous. The specter, my wife was known throughout Staten Island, people were in awe of her acts of kindness. And then they see her pass away from a terrible disease at the young age of 54. It leaves a question. So it's important to know, it's important to know that there are people that are given a shorter time on this world. It's not because of punishment. And they're great people. Like Shlom HaMelech. Shlom HaMelech had a thousand wives that needed him. And he still passed away at 52. 
Shmuel Anavi was needed by the entire generation. He passed away at 52. And Rabbi Boone in the Yishalmi passed away at 26. And the Arizal passed away in his 30s. And the Ramah passed away in his 40s. Even though it says, Chzam Seifer says, that Kol Yisrael Holchen Biyad Ramah Ashkenazic world relied on the Ramah. Ramah. He died in his 40s. Some people were given only a certain amount of years. That's their kates. When it's the kates, the person goes even if they're, if they're ne- needed and even if they're brilliantly righteous. Hashem gifted us these people for this amount of years. Rabbi Moshe, your Rebetzin had pancreatic cancer, Nishfakenim Gedach. Did you tell her the diagnosis, and should we tell the patient everything, no matter what? If there's no reason for the patient to know the diagnosis, so what do you want to do? You want to kill them? The doctors, they're afraid of getting sued. You have to sit down with the doctors and say, listen, if there's no reason for the patient to know, we always have to give the patient hope. My wife took care of many people with pancreatic cancer and watched them die. For a whole year, I kept from her, her diagnosis. And she said, look, Marsh, you're taking care of the doctors. I don't need to know exactly where it is. You're taking care of it. You tell me there's hope. That's good enough. And if the doctor said we have to tell her, I said, listen, if you want to treat my wife, we decided as the family, I'm the caregiver, we decided not to tell her. And she doesn't want to know. Now, sometimes a person wants to know because they want to get their affairs in order. Even the ones that say they want to know, when they find out, they wish they didn't know. But for sure, if you are visiting someone, don't tell them, oh, I hear you had this. That's how my wife found out. Somebody told her. You never tell a patient their diagnosis. And you never tell a patient, oh, I hear you have a very tough road. Are you trying to make it worse? You visit somebody, you're there to make them cheerful, to give them hope, to give them light. This, by the way, is a very big part of the refuah process. It's why we say in the Mishabeirach, first refuah sanefesh and then refuah saguf. Even before the refuah saguf is the refuah sanefesh, is the emotional uh, positivity of the chaylo of the chaylanis. I would constantly tell my Rebetzin what Rav... Ruvain Feinstein said, and that is that we don't have to be mispelled for a nace, we have to be mispelled bore refuas, like we say in the Kelbarok Nemax. And in medicine, you should know, they are today constantly making new things. My wife took state of the art treatments that when she started treatments, they didn't have these treatments yet. And even when she took sophisticated immunotherapies, PARP inhibitors for a genetic mutation that they had, which is one of the new treatments that they have, initially she took the PARP inhibitors eight times, eight pills in the morning and eight pills in the night, 16 pills a day, big pills. But by the time uh, she would finish the PARP inhibitors, she was t- they already had a new pill, that she only had to take four pills in the morning and four pills in the night. And they're constantly doing new things. And we constantly have to give hope. I heard from Ramosha that if there's no reason to tell the Chayla, then you shouldn't tell the Chayla. Chayla has to be upbeat. And if the news is going to crush them, why give it to them? The Rebbitzin had 32 chemotherapies with terrible side effects and had horrible pain. 
At what point should the family start looking into palliative care and is hospice a viable option? We have to be careful. We're living in a society, we're in the hospitals, and many of the doctors, and especially the nursing staffs, do not have Ashkafa Satayra. This is very important. We know that if somebody is dying, there's a halacha that you're not allowed to close their eyes, you're not allowed to touch a guy's because you might usher their death a moment earlier and that's considered ritzicha. Because one moment of life has tremendous value, as the Mepharshim say, in that moment a person could do tshuva and change their entire eternity. So even a moment of suffering life is worth a tremendous amount. Although Ramesha has tshuvas, there, there are certain times when the treatments only offer chayi shah, they only offer uh, temporary life, and the person is in horrendous suffering, and according to medical uh, knowledge, there is no derechateva hope, and the patient is suffering indescribable pain, that sometimes we can leave it up to the patient. The parameters of such cases are extremely rare. Because today, we have marvelous treatments and many options. And we have excellent ways to take care of pain. But you have to understand that there's a lot of things that play into the equation to a non-Torah mind, you call this life, you want to watch your relative suffer, and think about how many people's lives are put on hold and look at all the money being spent and there are times where the family is wiped out and even without them realizing it they're also at their, at their limit So first of all, hospice is murder. What's called hospice, to just give morphine and not even feed the patient and not even to starve the patient is murder. But once you accept hospice, the insurance will pay for 100%. They'll give you everything. Because they figured out that that's an easy way to save money. So you should know most hospice is euthanasia. It's murder. Now then there's palliative care. Now palliative care is a different story. There is no reason that a cancer patient should be suffering pain. You just have to figure out how that they shouldn't suffer. With good dosages of slow-release morphine, with proper use of oxycodone, with fentanyl patches, sometimes fentanyl sprays. There are ways to keep the patient without pain. I had an actual case a few weeks ago where the patient himself called me from the hospital and said that he was thinking about hospice. What do I think? I said to him, what do I mean, what, what, do I, what, do, what do I think? Your doctors say you have a chance to live three years. You have a son that wants you to walk you down the chuppah. Of course it's not a good option. And I gave him chizik, they were pushing him in the hospital. And I gave him chizik, and 
the children told me the next week he was home and he was already driving a car. Anytime somebody is in the hospital and this option is being pushed, you need to have extremely competent Rav guide you in this area. Ramosha, you were a caretaker for almost two and a half years. Do you have any advice for caretakers and what about helping the caretakers? You know, the Gemara says that when we we, the mitzvah bika chalim is even a hundred times a year, a hundred times a day. When we learned this in yeshiva, we thought it was an exaggeration. Truth of the matter is, it's an understatement. A hundred times, it could be a hundred times an hour. When people come to help the chayla or the chalanis, they also have to help the caretaker. And they have to help the caretaker the way the caretaker wants to be helped. Not the way, not, not the way that you think they should be helped. If they're not asking for medical advice, don't offer it. I know you believe in the soy root or broccoli therapy or to fly to Belgium for the next and have, you have all the aids. If, if the caretaker wants your advice, fine, don't push it on. If you could spell the caretaker and he, he or she wants that, do so. Many caretakers get sick because it's around the clock with no end in sight. If a person is a caretaker, they have to make sure that they get enough sleep. They have to make sure they eat properly. They can't afford to get sick. A caretaker has no Shabbos, no Yom Tov. I carried my phone with me on Yom Kippur. A caretaker, I came home five times on Yom Kippur, even though I'm a Rav of a shul. A caretaker has to know also that sometimes the patient could be hostile to the caretaker. I, I coined a phrase called caretaker hostility. I've seen this. It's because the patient, nobody wants to be totally dependent upon a person. And if you're totally dependent on a person, you resist. So that's normal and to be expected. The caretaker has to give hope, has to give love, has to give chizik. This is a very delicate subject. What is the Torah view of remarriage after losing a beloved spouse? Is it Torah dick to stay alone, to be loyal to the memory of a loved one? I believe that the idea of I'm going to be alone the rest of my life to be loyal to the memory of a loved one is a Goyish concept. There is no such makar anywhere in Chazal. Rabbi Kiva, who was married incredibly to the famous Rachel, who sacrificed for him, and he bought her the Yerushalayim shells of, he married afterwards. Avram Avinu who had the storybook marriage to Sari Imenu, who lived 127 perfect years, married 
the woman that his wife threw out of the house. Hug her. There is a Zoyar that it brings a Nechama to the Neshama of the Nifteris for the husband to remarry. This doesn't mean that it's easy. But that is the proper Torah Ashkafa. But what if the spouse made a dying wish not to remarry? I had two such cases. Where the spouse left a request to, to, the, to the surviving spouse that they shouldn't remarry. Both cases, I sent the people to Gedele Eretz Yisrael to ask the Shiloh. In both cases, the answer was from two different great Gedele Eretz Yisrael. The answer was that the spouse knows better now in Shemayim and they should remarry. The second time, You'll ask, why did I send him to a Gadol be Yisrael? I already knew the answer from the first time. And the answer is, I knew that the person would be ridden with guilt unless they heard it directly from the mouth of a Gadol Adar. But that's the answer to this bizarre question. And that is that in the, in, in the next world, the spouse knows better and they know that it's important for their spouse to remarry. I will add that my Rebetzin tried to talk to me about this subject. I remember it like it's in front of my... She grabbed my hands and she said, Maish, listen to me! And I refused to talk to her about it because I never wanted her to feel that I gave up hope on her. And I didn't. I didn't. She had a condition. She developed a fistula, a hole in the colon that was totally unexpected. She couldn't absorb anything. But we never gave up. And here's a good example. I remember that a year and a half before her passing, the hospital tried very hard for me to be involved in palliative care and basically make her comfortable. She would live almost a year and a half longer than that and walk down our last child to the chuppah and dance by the wedding with the help of IV in a side room. And then two weeks before her passing, hold her 17th grandchild and give a bracha, which we have on film. But my wife did tell our children instead. She couldn't talk to me. I didn't let her. So she told our children, Tati is young. He's going to have to remarry. And you better be good to her. Not that you have to tell my children that. Uh, these Shilas Yasi shouldn't be Nagaya. How should one handle the feelings of their children when they take another spouse? <laughs> Very gingerly. I have a rule in this. Married children should understand. Unmarried children cannot be expected to understand. If at all possible, involve the children in the remarriage process. Try to get their blessings and have them feel that they're part of the process. That will help a lot. The Torah addresses it when it says, Kabed es avicha, es l'rabo yiseishas avicha. So it includes a stepmother. It also has a, a rebuy for a stepfather. And that there is tremendous chiyav in kibud. But it's very difficult. And it's a uh, tightrope 
that has to be walked with great care and great understanding. Let's move on to other topics. In certain circles today, there is a fad to wear thick leggings or even pants under full-length skirts. Is there any sneeze concerns or to the contrary, the women are even more covered up? You know, you could smell the Eight Sahara a mile away. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> Remember when the Nachash told Chava, you, I hear you're not allowed to even touch the Eitz Adas! <laughs> the Nachash was a big magma, you're not allowed to even touch. Then he caused her to touch and he said, ah, you see, nothing happened. It's the way sometimes of the Eitz are to come as if, it, hey, what do you mean? What's better, I should run with my legs only with stockings, I have pants! <laughs> I'm more covered up! It says that the Yates are Hayyim Aymalaikach. Today he says this, and it's only a lead. What happens? She starts dressing that way, and then she comes home into the house. I'm only in the house. So either she takes off the pants and is left with a shorter skirt because she had the pants. Or she takes off the skirt and left with the pants. I'm at home. But then her girls come in and the girls see her in the pants. And what the girls see, then the next generation, well, we're going to exercise in sweats. It's only women. And we're just running in and out of the car with our pants. Well, what happens is, is, well, I'm wearing pants under the skirt. The skirt could get shorter. It just covers, you know, as long as it covers... My backside, it's okay. So there's a very short skirt. It goes, it, goes, it goes gradual. Just like it didn't start with pants under the skirt. It started with thick leggings. Thick leggings? What's the difference between thick stockings and thick leggings? Come on. From leggings, well, leggings, you know what? Why not pants? The leggings are near stick. The pants are even more near stick. That's how it goes. The pants are also not a feminine garment. So if you ask me, this fad is going down a slippery slope and it should be eradicated, if at all possible, in our families and if we set standards in our developments or in our circles, it should be eradicated from the development and the circles. Speaking about new fads, my husband wants to go to an all-men's weekend retreat. I don't feel it's right. What do you say? The tzura of Shabbos is to be with family. You know, it used to be that people ate dinner every night of the week with their family. That was the, the family sat down together at the dinner table. That got lost. But the last bastion of the family table is Shabbos. That should be sacred. That shouldn't be. A husband and wife, it's Ishtar Kigufai. They don't belong apart not to recreate without one's wife, to recreate without one's husband. It's not only all men's retreats. There are all women's retreats. Go to a, a weekend spa for women. That's not teridic. But Yossi, I'm not going to stop there. I remember a few years ago, in my bungalow colony, which is a fine Torah bungalow colony, they started a men's kiddush after davening. And the idea was for some healthy male bonding over single malt scotch and matches herring. I remember sitting with my wife, watching the first one get into action. And my wife... She said to me, Moshe, are you going to go make Kiddush for them? 
Yeah, I'm the Rav there, like unofficially. And I usually make Kiddush Bay. I said, I'm not happy with this. She said, neither am I. They're away from their wives the whole week. And now they're home only on the weekend. They're going to keep their wives waiting with the family so that they could schmooze over some whiskey. So they came that I should make Kiddush. And I said, I'm not making it. They said, why not? They said, it's under protest. Both my, myself and my wife feel that you're here only on the weekend. You shouldn't be keeping your family waiting. So they got the message. And they changed it to a couple's Kiddush. It's not only that. I find something else which is disturbing to me. Couples get together for Shabbos meal, and because it's Nias, the men sit with the men, and the women sit with the women. The men are happy with their masculine talk, and the women are happy to chit-chat their feminine chit-chat. But that's not the tzura of a Shabbos table. I never sat, even when I went away, there was never a time that my wife didn't sit at my side on Shabbos meal. Whether I went to Mel Shik and Katz to part of Pesach, whether I went to a, a Wallerstein Shabbaton, uh, I, I never, even in that good convention, my wife and I sat in the Rabbanim's dining room. They had small tables. My wife and I sat together. Every Rav, Rabbi Obam sat with his wife. Rabbi Feiner sat with his wife. Rabbi Raubach sat with his wife. Sit apart from your wife. There's something wrong. So my answer, Yossi, is a resounding no. I do not like these all men or all women weekend retreats. Nor do I like all male kiddishes. Nor do I like when a husband and wives. We have to know we're modeling how to behave for our children. Children see my mother and father were never apart. That's the way hopefully they'll run their marriage as well. Dear Rabbi Weiss, my son recently told me he saw one of his friends viewing something highly inappropriate on his iPhone. I want to tell the parents, but if I do, it could destroy my son's relationship with his friend. What should I do? Yeah, this is a, this is a, uh, happens more often than you think. And it doesn't only happen with a son. It could happen that you see your friend on his iPhone doing something highly inappropriate. What do you do? If you tell it to your friend's face, there's no way he could say face. And it uh, could be very unpleasant. So they asked Rav Miller this question many times in many different shapes and forms. And Rav Miller would say, write an anonymous letter. Write a respectful anonymous letter. Dear so-and-so, you don't know me, but I sent the, I, I, I saw your son watching this and this on his iPhone. I'm sure you're not aware of it. I wanted to bring it to your attention. We live in challenging times. I know I'm also a, pa a parent. Respectfully, name withheld. Make sure when you send it, it doesn't have the postmark of your house on it. <laughs> You've accomplished what you needed to without getting anybody in trouble. Ramosh, I don't know if you know, but I've been very extremely successful in the real estate market. Is there anything to be concerned with living a five-star lifestyle commensurate with my new wealth? You heard, you heard what he said, so all the collectors can see Yossi after this year. Uh, Somebody says, listen, I have, I'm worth 30, 40 million dollars. So what's wrong with, uh, and I work hard for that, 
What's wrong with living according to my means? I like to have a cowboy steak every other night. And I like to wash it down with a hundred dollar bottle of wine. Yeah, listen. What's the problem that we have a jacuzzi in every bedroom? Is there anything wrong with the fact that I have a maid and a butler in the house? After all, Shalom Bayis, I'm making it easier for my wife. There are certain dangers. The first thing is a parent has to say, what lifestyle am I getting all my children used to living? They're going to get married. We send them to good yeshivas. They're going to marry Taira people. Their husbands are not going to be in real estate. And I'm not going to be able to give each of the husbands $20 million. So the, all of a sudden, she won't be able to use a tablecloth without a plastic tablecloth and all china because she doesn't have two maids doing the dishes. But she's not used to eating without china. And she's not used to doing the dishes. She never saw her mother do it. So that means that we're not preparing our children for the lifestyle that they're going to live. That's a serious concern. The other concern is the galgel ha'choyze ba'olam. That money, it says about money, easy come, easy go. The ben Saira Amira, the worry was that he'll get used to his gluttonous ways, which was the cowboy steaks and the wine, and then he'll run out of money, and he'll be molaste mesabrius. And he'll rob and be Michal Shabbos. So there's always a worry that if we get ourselves used to all the time a very lavish lifestyle, what happens if there's a reversal from riches to rags? What's that going to do to us? So therefore these two things have to be kept in mind. What lifestyle am I getting my children used to? And will I be able to cope if I have a reversal? And will my family be able to cope if I have a reversal? Speaking of fancy lifestyles, is it tyrannic to have such lavish, over-the-top tzedakah fundraisers? Yeah. I've heard about them. I really haven't seen them yet. They haven't asked me to speak by them. Maybe they're afraid. But... Uh, I have no problem with fundraisers that serve delicious ribs and a smorgasbord of sushi. I have no problem with that. I have a problem with fundraisers that glorify improper behavior. So I have a problem with a fundraiser that has cigar rolling. Because I don't think we should, a tzedakah organization, should be giving approval to cigars. It's an addictive, poisonous substance. The same thing is true that I don't like elaborate wine tasting. Because I don't like to give a platform for wine. You're drinking it on Shabbos by a wedding. I'm talking about the Chassan and Kala. Uh, by Yom Tov table, ain't Simcha ala babasa v'yayin. But to give, there is a long line of battered children, of battered wives, ben achar ben, because of alcoholics. So I do not like and I think it's poor judgment for stuckers to do fundraisers 
that give a platform for wine, for cigar rolling, or for a casino night. My son is turning down Shaduchim because of looks. My daughters feel he is immature for turning down great girls one after another for this reason. They tell him, don't judge a book by its cover. He's getting older. Are they right? They're wrong. You can't tell a person to marry someone that they're not ready to make the most important person in their life. That they're not ready to look at and feel good about. Now, there are many men and women that can look past us. But if the young man or young lady can't, it's a tremendous mistake to insist upon it. I have seen that marriages went sour afterwards, and I asked the young man, and he said, look, she's meas to me. So I said, so why did you marry her? They pushed me. They told me, don't judge a book by its cover. Now, so what do we do about it? If there is a young man or a young lady that sees that looks are an issue, for that young man and that young lady, it would be good if they see a picture before. So you'll say, but you know, Rabbi Wax, looks could grow on the person. That's true. But if you see that this is an issue, that when the looks aren't there, it's called off right away, so then, first of all, spare the other person the rejection. And they think that maybe it's something wrong with them. That's number one. Number two, you have to know that if you push the young man, then he stops dating. Because he says, look, I can't take the pressure. They want to know why, and they don't, they don't, they don't want to hear from me that I don't like the way that I have to make things up. I don't like the whole pressure. I'll stop dating. And I've seen that too. And I think that that's why we're going to find in our society that online dating is going to become more mainstream. And in general, the more information that people write about themselves, the better it is before the date. What they're looking for, what their dreams are, what their ambitions are, that's good. Because one of the problems we have is people are getting burnt out from all the uh, unnecessary dating. Where if they would have seen the picture or heard about certain things, they wouldn't have gone out. I know that this is a uh, controversial approach, but I feel very strongly about this. Dear Rabbi Weiss, in our development, there are children's, children galore on Shabbos riding scooters and skateboards. They play basketball and put on play clothing. Is this the proper ruach for Shabbos? says him toshiv mishabbos raglecha if you withhold on shabbos your feet that means that on shabbos we act differently it says that initially we thought the rabbis who ran to shear on shabbos were mechal shabbos running to shear at first, the Gemara says we thought that the rabbis running to Shir on Shabbos were Mechalal Shabbos because it says him Toshiv Mishabbos Reglecha. When it's, they saw that it says Nir Defol Adas Hashem, so we also ran. 
run to know Hashem, we also ran. But you see that they thought that running to a shir is Chilu Shabbos. Shabbos is a day of menucha. It says, I might think that we could leave the cow in the stable on Shabbos. Because it says, Shri says, Behemtai. So says Rashi, you can't leave him cooped up in the stable. Why not? Shri says, Behema. That's not Menucha, that's Tzar. So there has to be a balance between Menucha and being bored and being cooped up. That's the challenge of being a parent. Today, everybody says, I, I can't stop them. Everybody else is doing it. That's why we have to set up standards. We have to set up standards. So, you know, it's very complex. We have a lot of children. What are we supposed to do with the children? Well, we have to figure it out. That's why there are board games. That's why there are books. That's why we spend time with our children. Where are we going to draw the line? They're playing basketball. The whole development is playing basketball. What if they put on tennis shorts and play tennis? What's the difference? What if they go to the paddle ball court? No, paddle ball, tennis, and shops. Basketball? What are you doing online? What is this? I'm, I'm feeling my way? He said over from a palm, famous story. It became publicized recently that uh, Rapam used to fly the American flag on July 4th. So he had a granddaughter from out of town that was dating from his house. So she said, Bobby, maybe Zabri won't fly the flag. I'm going out with a very yeshivish boy. He might not understand. So she said, don't worry. Zadie's too weak to put up the flag. So the young man comes to the house, and before he leaves, your palm says, Efshar, I could ask you to do me a favor. I need help putting up the flag. <laughs> but that's not what's funny about the story. The young Anakal is telling her Bobby what's yeshivish to the Rosh Hashiva of Tavadas. She's afraid the young man would feel that it's not yeshiva shina. What are we doing? We're feeling our way around? Basketball feels yeshiva. Scooters feel yeshiva. Tennis shorts and tennis doesn't feel yeshiva. When they ask us if we're a shomer Shabbos, what does that mean? It means, are we girding the Shabbos? Shimer, are we a Shimer? Now, in the, in the camps, they risk their lives not to go down to the mine on Shabbos and hid in the barracks. If they were caught, they would be killed. We have to figure out ways that Shabbos shouldn't look like a regular day. That in front of the shul there's a veritable parking lot of scooters. And it's a regular day at the ball field. Is that Shabbos? Is that the Yom Menucha? I've said this before. That they asked Rabbi Blumenkrantz, all of us, Shalom, if girls could go apple picking on Cholamoyed. Uh, Rabbi Rumenkrantz said if they only take apples that they're going to use on Cholamoyed and Yom Tov, so it's a Tzarech HaMoyed, you're allowed to do it. You're allowed to be Kaitzer, Le Tzarech HaMoyed. 
But he said one proviso. They have to go in their yomt of clothing. If they're going to put on denim because they don't want to get their yomt of clothing dirty, then they can't go. It's chalamayit. There's such a thing called Ruach Shabbos. There's such a thing as an Uvda Dechel. If it's a weekday activity, you know that there are certain Paiskim that didn't allow chess on Shabbos. Unless you bought a special chess set. So now somebody will say, we'll get a Shabbos stick a scooter. We'll get a Shabbos stick a basketball. Not the same. I'm just pointing out that they even said it. They even said it about chess. My answer to this question is we should try whatever we can that Shabbos should look like a day of rest. I do not think the transportation of scooters and skateboards and rollerblades and playing full press, full court basketball is a Shabbat, Shabbat stick ice cook. And I think it's of the Dachau. Despite my tremendous success in real estate, <laughs> I asked one of my children's schools for a break in tuition since we are very, very tight. I would be very suspicious <laughs> of this. <laughs> they wanted to know where I gave my MISA money. I happen to give my mice some money to a sibling with a special child. Do they have a right to ask such a question? You might, you might, you know, you might have been distracted by Yossi's uh, radiophonic voice. You might not have caught it. So it's, it's, it, this is an unbelievable question. An unbelievable question. <clears throat> uh, but this is a true story. A person went. Both husband and wife work, but they uh, have ch a lot of children. In between the uh, the tuition and the day camp, and the medical policy, and the and the and the mortgage, and the cars, they came against me. So they asked for a break. It's an Arabic couple. They give mice. The yeshiva wanted to know where do you give your mice, because we want it. Now, the family gave their miser to a sibling that has a special child. They want to know if the, if the yeshiva has the right to say, no, don't give it to the sibling, give it to us. You owe us the money for tuition. You understand, this has nothing to do whether tuition is part of miser or not. They're saying, give it to us as, a, as an institution of tzedakah because you, you owe us the money. This is a dangerous thing. When the yeshivas are controlling our lives to the point that they could even strip us of the prerogative to give miser to a sibling, then there's something wrong with our society. When a yeshiva could send a letter to a grandparent, and tell the grandparent, this is true also, and tell the grandparent, you live in Eretz Yisrael, you send money to your children for tickets to come to visit you for Pesach because you want to pay, see your grandchildren. Before you do that, pay for your grandchildren's tuition. And do it out seeing your grandchildren. It's also true. We all know 18 years ago, 16 years ago, whatever the number is, when the first Jewish observer, all of our shalom, Zechot Tzadik Levracha, when the first Jewish observer came out with its entire magazine on children at risk, if you made a graph, you'll see that that's about when 
our economic situation forced the women out of house to start working. So ready at that time, tuition has its clause into the family structure and ripped apart the family structure. Now, tuition is not the enemy. We need good rebellion. We want our best boys to become rebellion. And in order to get our best boys to become rebellion, we have to offer them competitive salaries. So we know that we have to have tuition. <laughs> that's, that's obvious. But I, I want to point out a few things. First of all, there is a tremendous um, there's a tremendous disparate grouping in Klal Yisrael today. We have multi and multi millionaires. And we have people that have to buy the fruit on the outside of the fruit store. We have people that can't imagine what to do with all their money. And we have people that can't buy a snack, a black and white, because they can't buy it for all their children and they won't eat something that they can't buy for their children. If the first group would help our tuition system, then it would be possible for the middle class to live respectable lives. A lot of the middle class go to sleep worrying how they're going to make it. And I don't think that the answer is taking a miser away from a sibling with a special child. I don't think the answer is taking the few dollars of a grandparent who is not making money and living on Social Security and some meager saying, savings, stopping that grandparent from seeing his grandchildren on Pesach. I don't think that's the answer. Now, There are different types of schools. There are schools that are private businesses, and then there are schools that are community owned, are community based. Many of the community schools are run by hard working, well meaning volunteers, men and women who give of their own time to volunteer. But that doesn't give them the knowledge, the Torah wisdom to make these decisions. In many communities, they do. Then they get it rubber stamped by some rabbi. That's not the way to make these decisions. The Schools that are privately owned, that's even more complicated. Who's to decide what they could do to make more money? And therefore, let this be a clarion call that we need to have a standardized set of rules that volunteers should not be making these decisions on the fly Depends who has pull with which board member. That's not the way to make these life decisions. And if they're businesses, a community school should at least be run by all the community rabbanim. Community rabbanim know the constituency of their constituency of their community. And if it's a business. There should be, just like we have a cashless institution, there should be, like the building department, inspections 
so that we know that there is no greed and we know that the money is being properly asked for. This needs a lot of tikkun. There's a lot of evil in the system today. Some of it willful and some of it unwitting. But there's a lot of rot in our school system. Those children that are told not to come into a classroom until money is paid, those children that can't get into a school, the doors of Olam above Gan Eden will not swing easily for people that do these things. So this is a very serious area that needs tikkun in Klal Yisrael. We heard earlier your feelings about cigar smoking. What is your view about e-cigarettes and vaping? I mentioned this question to my son, Nehemia, who's a wonderful Rebbe by Rabbi Bender in Farakway. And Nehemia said to me, Tati, why are you, they asking you this question? Why did I ask this question to a doctor? And he has a point. You want to know if e-smoking is good? Ask your doctor. You're yeshiva bacha, you know, we learn. What doctor is going to say that an e-cigarette, where a person ingests nicotine, where there's a technology, where stuff is heated, which causes formaldehyde, which we don't know what it causes yet, but as the Surgeon General said, it's dangerous for your health. Why would anybody do such a thing? The answer is, of course it's not allowed. But again, this is the way of the Yitzhahara. Okay, we, I, I can't pull off the smoking anymore. <laughs> they, 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 I've been found. They found out about the smoking. It's worked for a while. I, got, I killed a lot of people, but my time is up. So now let me try to work on this vaping stuff. Listen, if somebody is coming down from smoking and he's working his way down, and he starts with e-cigarettes, that's something else, but to start with e-cigarettes, that's insane! Rabbi Moshe, thank you for your time tonight. No, no, there's another yeah, I know, question. I just wanted to thank you before I uh, ask you the final question. Probably won't have a chance after. And finally, what's your opinion of medical marijuana? <laughs> Okay, first of all, that's not funny. Medical marijuana is a wonderful gift from Hashem. Medical marijuana is probably one of the best treatments against nausea. Nausea, if a person never experienced nausea from chemotherapy, it is a overwhelmingly terrible experience. I've watched my wife in the throes of nausea. It grips a person and makes life unbearable. My wife as a Rebbitzin just didn't want to take the med medical marijuana. I had it for her, but she didn't want to take it. She couldn't bring herself as a Rebbitzin to take it. She so she took, there are other things, there are denestrin, there are other things, I gave it to her an IV, but medical marijuana, when used properly, is a wonderful thing. It not only stops nausea, but it also facilitates the appetite. Appetite is a very big challenge for someone who is ill. They don't have an appetite. First of all, chemotherapy sometimes kills the taste buds. For over a year, my wife ate without tasting food. She used to tell me, Maish, I smell your chalant. I'm enjoying your chalant from the smell. She didn't taste it. person doesn't taste their food. They don't really have a tremendous time to eat. If they start losing weight, they don't have the strength to fight the disease. Facilitating appetite is also a very important thing. 
But here's a very important point, Yossi. A caretaker that has all of these things in the house, the op opioids, the Percocets, and the tranquilizers, the Xanaxes, the Valiums, the Clonopins, and the fentanyl, and the sprays, and the morphine, and the Toradol, that can't fall into anybody else's hands. The caretaker can't take it to make his or her life easier. The children can't take it to cope with seeing a parent suffering. These are highly addictive substances. Many lives were ruined because they got used to these addictive substances. They have skull and bones on it. 20,000 volts. Beware. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Yossi. You know, I mentioned earlier that somebody who is in grief should have good friends surrounding him. Yossi has been such a friend to me. Um, we should pray not to get sick. We should pray that this should be only theoretical. We should pray it for our spouses, for our parents, for our children, for our rebellion. The Rambam says in Chalik, in the last parak of Sanhedrin, in Pirish Mishnayis, that when Mashiach comes, then there will not be people dying young. For this alone, it makes it easy to hope for Mashiach. In the schus of the two floors of women, the one floor of men, in the schus of all those that are watching on Yeshiva World, on TCN, on Irgun, on TorahAnytime.com, on Kol Aloshin, we should be zaycha, v'seilicheinu, koimimius, la'atzeinu, b'mher v'yameinu, amen. Hanani ben Akash Amaratza Kadish Baruchul is a Kaisis Yisrael. Lafika Kirbalem Tara Mitzvah Shinam Adi Nai Chafetz. Laman Sitka Yadu Tara Viade.